Okay. All right, then. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, Pass, and welcome. And for those of you that joined my pre-con on Tuesday, welcome back. I uh, certainly hope all of you are enjoying a great conference and are ready to learn more today. Uh, we're kicking it off early here. It's uh, 8 a.m. Eastern, and uh, I'm ready to get started talking to you about data modeling and partitioning patterns in Azure Cosmos DB. I, I might have appended to that what every relational database developer needs to know. Uh, that would have been a lot of words cramming on there. But this is definitely targeting a SQL group, a uh, the you know the past community. Uh, we're all SQL people, and this no SQL thing, you know. Uh, can rub us the wrong way. Uh, and so uh, we have certain patterns and practices in our mind about how we do data modeling in the relational world. How does that translate in the world of Cosmos DB or does it and how does it? So that's what, you know, that's the, uh, the premise for this. So no real prior knowledge of Cosmos DB is being assumed. Uh, obviously if you have some, that'll be helpful, but I'm gonna cover everything you need to know to follow along with the session and gonna take this moment also to encourage you to explore all of the other offerings uh, available to the community, bypass, free resources, lots of you know, virtual groups, local groups, SQL Saturdays and so on. You know, there's always lots out there and you know, great credit to them for keeping our community thriving at a time when it needs it the most, right? I um, want to encourage you to submit your evals. Uh, we definitely want to hear how you're doing. Um, we love to hear good things, but if you have um, any critique, we, we need to hear that too. So uh, definitely fill out your session evals. Let us know how we're doing and how we can improve. About myself, my name is Lenny Lobel. I'm uh, here in New York City now. I'm a Microsoft uh, MVP in data platform, and I've been doing this for a long time. Um, I do lots of speaking and writing. Uh, there's, I have a lot of content out in the older days in the form of books, nowadays in the form of Pluralsight courses. So a lot of what I'm covering today is covered in my Pluralsight courses uh, at a slower pace and in slightly more depth than the 75 minutes we'll have today to cover this content. But uh, I think we'll have no trouble following along. And let's just jump right in now uh, with our objectives. So we can kind of level set what our expectations are. We're, like I said, I'm not assuming really any kind of hard knowledge or, or, or deep knowledge of Cosmos DB or really any at all. We're gonna get familiar with the, the core concepts, partitioning namely, which is like the core concept in Cosmos DB. And then we're gonna apply that knowledge to learn about the best practices for modeling our data in Cosmos DB. And we're gonna do that by applying these concepts and these ideas to something that you're gonna all find very familiar. And that would be AdventureWorks or something smaller based on AdventureWorks, but basically a, a typical traditional relational data model, but you will by the end of the session come to understand the, the big differences between a NoSQL uh, database or the way you would model for a NoSQL database and the way you would model for a, a relational uh, database like SQL Server or Oracle or you know any of those. So uh, we got to define Cosmos DB first. That's going to be uh, the first thing we're going to do. But uh, again, there's many, many ways we could define Cosmos DB. Uh, and I'm just listing like the headlines there. It's a globally distributed, it's horizontally partitioned, it's schema free, it's multi-model, and it's a lot more. And I just didn't want to keep going. But for the purposes of this session, when we talk about NoSQL and you know what's what is Cosmos DB, we just need, I'm just gonna limit it to these two definitions. It is horizontally scalable and it is non-relational. So let's just see what those two terms actually mean. Uh, in Cosmos DB, we store data in containers. A database will have one or more containers very loosely, very loosely, like a database will have one or more tables. Right. At the root, you have one database, and then you have multiple tables in that database. You would have multiple containers in a Cosmos DB database. But that's a very loose analogy. When we interact with the container. It's a single logical resource to us. Uh, we just read and write documents to and from it. And behind the scenes, however, Cosmos DB will manage the hardware. It will manage physical servers. And these black boxes, what I'm calling physical servers, 
is a slight oversimplification. You, know, you can think of them just as an ordinary machine, uh, but they're actually what we would call physical partitions, which for the purpose of this discussion, think of it just like a physical machine, a server, a box. And when you need more, you just add more to the cluster, but although Cosmos DB is doing this transparently behind the scenes and more and more and so on. Now, again, each one of these is a, a box. Like it has a CPU, it has its storage capacity. And, you know, so if you think about it, you know, the more of these you add, the more storage you get and the more throughput you get in the form of CPU power being now scaled out horizontally. And so you get both unlimited storage and unlimited throughput. If you do things right, if you partition your data properly, which we're gonna to wanna to do for a relational data model, which is what this session is all about. Though I should note that Cosmos DB is not limited to modeling relational or stateful data. It could also be a, an event-driven source, uh, an event-driven store, rather. Um, so there you have it. Um, now, what was the second term I used, right? So that's horizontally scalable, okay? I also said it was non-relational, right? So in our world, in the relational world we have, tables with rows, and what is it that we love to do more than anything in the world with these rows? Oh, we love to join them. Oh, that's what gets us off, right? I mean, that's what, that's what really gets us going. So when we can like normalize our data and break things out in a very logical way and in a, in a very uh, normalized way without repeating ourselves, without duplicating data and getting just the right relationships between our parent-child entities and our uh, primary foreign keys are all lined up, for this beautiful interconnected model. Well, in Cosmos DB, we saw data in JSON documents, which I guess you could make as, a, as an analogy to a row. And you can store anything you want in a JSON document, like you can store anything you want in a row. So there's nothing stopping you from kind of doing the same thing. And, you know, I, I, I don't want to use the word foreign keys because there are no foreign keys in Cosmos DB, but we can call them references. We could say that one, you know, each document has a property that will you know, reference the ID of another document and kind of model our data the same way. Nothing would stop us from doing that, but we wouldn't succeed, it would break down. That, that, that model just breaks down. It just doesn't work in Cosmos DB. And the, why is that? That again ties back to being horizontally scalable. So those two kind of tie together. When, we, when documents are written to a container, they can land on any one of these physical partitions and that's transparent to us. That's, that's completely um, you know, behind the scenes and we're not, we don't control which physical partition any document will get written to. And so since these are physical machines, I mean, there's technically nothing stopping you from really enforcing constraints uh, between these things. But the fact is that there are service level agreements that uh, maintain a very, very high level of performance, a super high level of performance uh, for delivering data out of Cosmos DB, no matter how much data you have. And uh, I'm talking single digit millisecond access if you do, in most cases, uh, no matter how big your container is, um, you know, less than 10 milliseconds. Reads and, write, reads and writes. And that's just not gonna be possible if you have all the overhead of constraints and, and referential integrity and that sort of thing. So that one then begged the question, well, that doesn't sound very good. Is Cosmos DB gonna be suitable for my kind of like AdventureWorks or you know, I'll have a mini version of AdventureWorks called Web Store database? Well, the answer of course it is. Otherwise the session would be over in eight minutes. <laughs> uh, we wouldn't have anything more to talk about. And um, actually, as a, I should, thought I fixed that slide to say many workloads are actually relational. I wouldn't, it doesn't have to say most workloads. Like I said, it could, it, you could have event-based event, event uh, based databases, uh, databases where you store events, where there's only ever inserts. There's never updates and deletes because if something needs to be updated, that's an insert of an event representing the update, or this is the insert of an event representing the delete. And you can certainly do that, but that's another session. Uh, on, on like, like IoT and, and microservices. But I'm talking about now just moving our like AdventureWorks database into Cosmos DB. Is it feasible? Is it doable? Is it something we'd want to do? And the answer is yes. It's certainly something we could and should do. And if we, if we need the global scale and, and, uh, uh, and the other massive scale features that Cosmos DB offers, it certainly is attractive. But we just have to think about things differently. It is a huge shift away from doing things the way that we're used to doing them. For some of us, for decades, let's say, if we've been doing this for a really long time, there are these hard and fast rules. And, and if we start, are, are, are gonna start being asked to kind of like break those rules, it's kind of a difficult thing to do at first. But uh, that's what we're gonna do. We're gonna take a new approach 
like I said, many of your best practices are our best practices from the relational world. They will not translate well. Uh, if you try to, again, just model things the same way, you know, it's just not going to work out very well. You'll, it, it, you'll be able to do it, but it won't scale and it won't perform and, you know, you might be out of a job, at least in the cosmos front. So let's make, let's make it right. And let's look at what we're talking about. This is my stripped down version of adventure works. It's, it's, it's. Actually, when I started out, I, I was a little ambitious that I was going to migrate the entire AdventureWorks database, and it was you know, quite large. And I, I kind of realized that, hey, what I need is a couple of one-to-many's, many-to-many's, things, you know, typ typical relational patterns, one-to-ones, like a customer table with a one-to-many on the address, with a primary foreign key on customer ID, and a one-to-one -one on the password, right? We, we have a hash and, and a salt value for each customer, but just one for each customer. But we don't want to store it in the customer table, so we have a separate table for it, right? So there's one to one there, and then we have uh, also have one to many between products and product categories, right? Between products and product categories on the product category ID, one product category. We'll have multiple products, and on the side of tags, we'll have a many to many with that you know very familiar uh, junction table product tags. I'm trying to point my laser pointer, and now it's like Control Click in in PowerPoint now to point my laser pointer. You're not gonna see it if I just point my, point this guy, <laughs> uh, right? So that's the junction table right there that's uh, giving the many to many between product and product tag. And sales order, which of course is a one to many between customer and sales order, right? And then there's a third level deep between uh, another child relationship then on sales order detail. And, and that is definitely, uh, well representative of most of our typical patterns. And if we can just kind of migrate this in an efficient way over to Cosmos DB. How can you? Do you see web store relational model? And then my machine is frozen. I've been talking over a frozen screen for too long. My screen is not being shared properly. I have to do a new share. Has anyone been saying anything? Okay. Right, but I, I was hoping, I hope, were you able to see all of this while I was talking? That's unfortunate. I'm going to just go back and rush through those. All right, so next time the screen share goes, um, maybe... Okay, well, I, I, I'm moving through slides, so it should be constantly moving. So here we have a horizontally scalable container. Uh, if you didn't get to see it before, those are physical partitions behind a, contain behind a container, each with a, a, a physical storage and a CPU. So you can get unlimited storage and unlimited throughput that way. And we were talking about how you'd be like, like to join rows, but in fact, we use JSON documents. And if you try to do the same thing with JSON documents, that doesn't work because we're being, again, horizontally scalable and asking us, is it therefore uh, suitable for relational workloads? Are they, yeah, otherwise, yeah, we'd be done, but we just have to think about things differently. And then I kind of walked through this model that unfortunately uh, you were not able to see, but if I was describing it well enough, there you can see the customer table. Oop, no, that was me. Customer table, you can see a red box around the customer address table now. Yeah. One to many there, a one to one between customer and password, a one to many between product and product category, a many to many, and that's where I'm pointing my PowerPoint laser with PowerPoint uh, between product and product tag, and a one to we have a one to many from customer to sales order. One customer has many sales orders, and then from sales order to sales order detail, that's. Um, one to many, one further level deep. And that's kind of what I was describing while you were unfortunately unable to see my screen. So um, just kind of really, uh, yeah, alert me if, it, if the screen doesn't advance uh, at any point because I am moving through content. Uh, 
pretty, visually pretty rapidly. Thanks. So your first intuition, right, which we talked about might not be your best intuition, would be if you have nine tables, maybe I want nine containers. You could do that. Nothing would stop you from doing it. Would it be a good idea, though? And hopefully, I've kind of at least given you the impression that this would not be a good choice. This would not scale well. You wouldn't be, you wouldn't, there would be uh, uh, a tremendous amount of uh, scalability issues and problems with this. And, and let's, let's, let's see what we can do to improve it. And actually what we're going to do during this session is we're going to advance through four versions of this data model where this is version number one. I'm not going to spend any time on it because it is the, it is the, the, most poorest is the poorest version of the four and we're going to advance to the best uh, uh, by version four so we have one container for each table uh but what's really the proper way to do this well we're going to break it down we're going to take our customer related items and we're going to make this a multi-step process the first step is to like look at your tables and look at your columns we're looking at a customer oh, we're looking at three tables now right yeah and um the first thing you're going to do is translate those column names to property names, just like I've done here. And I've done actually two things. First of all, I've camel cased everything, which uh, wasn't necessary, but uh, is usually something you'd want to do because that's just the convention for JSON and uh, in general. And uh, secondly, you'll notice that the ID property itself has been renamed. So it's no longer customer ID, it's ID. It's no longer customer address ID, it's ID in every single case. And that is not something I could control because in Cosmos DB, every document needs a property called ID, lowercase, okay? And so that was the translation. Now, another translation that I've done that you can't see here is that I've converted the IDs to GUIDs. And I, I could have actually found an alternate way of handling this. And we'll, I'll explain what this is about more later. But for now, imagine I've done cascading updates. So if I change a, pro, a table's primary key value from an integer to a GUID with cascading updates on, then that GUID will flow down to all the trial tables. and uh, it, uh, But it will otherwise be the identical interrelated data model. Do we have any questions at this point? No, we don't. Thank you. Okay, great. So, but what are we doing? We're just mimicking, all right? Uh, we're just mimicking what we had before. These aren't really foreign keys. These are more like, again, again, I said references where the customer address table has a customer ID, which is not a foreign key, but more like just a reference to the parent customer. And so does the password. Do we have to do it this way? And when you just pause and think about it and understand the way JSON is structured, you realize, of course, no, we, we, could, we could embed, you know, we can embed all that information in a single document. And on this, in this case, I've got an addresses array with, a, with space to only show one address, but because it's an array, it could have a, a number of addresses, not a huge number, but a reasonable number to fit in a document. And the password is just a one-to-one, -one, so that's nested as an object. And now, if you, all of a sudden, once you embed, you, you eliminate the problem of not being able to join and not being able to have referential integrity because at this point, you've, you've, you know, everything is pre-joined, right? And by virtue of being nested beneath a parent, you, there's your referential integrity. So you kind of just kind of eliminate the problem altogether simply by embedding and taking these three entities and turning them into one, okay? So now the question, embed or reference? We see that slide? Great. All right, so um, that's our document. Or we could have done it with a reference. Which is the way to go? Well, you're going to want to prefer to embed when you can. When it's a one-to-one -one like the password or a one-to-few, what's a one-to-few? In SQL Server, it's either one-to-one -one or one-to-many. And once you need more than one, it's one-to-many. But in Cosmos DB, or when you're modeling for a JSON document data model, uh, you um, think of a one to few as you know anything that's reasonable to fit. So there's also a one to many relationship between customer and sales orders. But you know that's a lot of sales orders. At least we hope it's a lot of sales orders, right? You certainly wouldn't want to impose an upper limit on the number of sales orders per customer. But it's completely reasonable to say you know 
uh, hold on a reasonable number of addresses. You don't need an unbounded number of addresses. You could say maybe 10 addresses is way more than enough, but even that wouldn't be an issue. Or if it's a many to many. And then independently of that, we have here at the bottom, relate, you know, you'll also want to embed, you know, independently of this criteria, if and when related items are, are frequently queried or updated together. Because then obviously if it's in the same document, then you can pull back one document instead of more than one. Um, and when you update, it's just one update, you know, so that's kind of obvious. And, and you know, um, but, but you can, you can have um, asymmetric patterns, you know, where, uh, you know, uh, uh, they, you know uh, they, they might be queried or updated very much independently. And, you know, even though it's a one to few, you, you still might want to reference because they rarely are queried together and they rarely are updated together. So it wouldn't really make sense to embed. Those are the kind of things to think about. So we're going to go with embedding. I'm going to do a quick time check. So I think we might have lost a little bit of time earlier. Um, yeah. Um, so now we need to move forward and talk about, oops, I did that again storing that data in a container. And when you store data in a container, you need to partition it. What does that mean? It means you need to pick a partition key. What's the proper partition key? We can't answer that question until we understand partitioning. So we're gonna pivot now over to partitioning and then come back. So remember this picture that I kind of blazed through a second time since you unfortunately missed it the first time. This is a container and there are physical partitions behind it. Let's drill into three of those physical partitions. And we see three large black boxes now, right? Cool. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to just start storing data to the container and Cosmos DB, like I said, is going to choose which physical partition to use. And uh, how does it know which one to use? And how does it know where each document is? That, that has to do with our choice of partition key. So we, the human, we, the data modeler, we pick a partition key that defines the logical partitions for the container. When we create a partition, uh, when we create a container, rather, we'll be asked for a partition key for that new container. And if I go with a social networking example where I pick the username, let's say, as the partition key, that would be a good choice. It would mean, and let's forget about the physical partitions for now, let's just look at the logical partitions that we defined by our partition key. And if it was the username, it would mean all of Tim's documents in one container, all of Andrew's in one container, and so on, where these can all be documents of different types because in NoSQL, there's no schema. So in one logical partition, let's say Tim's, this one, uh, this first document could be Tim's user profile. And the next bunch could be his uh, Tim's posts. Maybe these are Tim's comments to other posts. Maybe these are Tim's likes. So they're all of different types, but what they all share in common is the same partition key. And the same is true for all the others. And that makes it very efficient to retrieve the, all the documents within this within a single logical partition as opposed to across logical partitions, which is what a cross partition query is. It's important to understand these constraints. So two megabytes is your upper limit, you know, so definitely a handful of addresses is not an issue, but you certainly wouldn't want to, couldn't cram all of the sales orders for a customer in one of those. You could store all of the sales order details for a sales order within two megabytes comfortably. And a maximum logical partition size of a very nice high number, you know, 20 gigs. So, you know, it's, uh, you've got a lot of flexibility to work with there. Usually you want very small individual logical partitions that are nice and uniformly distributed. But if and when you need like a, just a lookup list, you'll never have to work, you know, a lookup list of any reasonable size can easily fit inside a logical partition. I'm going to show you a quick picture of partition splits. This is kind of a little bit um, interesting behind the scenes. The power of Cosmos DB it lies in this partition splits. Here I've got a container that I, with two physical partitions and I've been storing documents and they've been grouped by logical partition based on my partition key. However, they've been arbitrarily landing on different physical partitions. Well, I shouldn't say arbitrarily, but behind the scenes, not known to us which physical partition is being written to until at some point Cosmos DB will decide to split a partition because it's grown too busy. And too busy can mean too full or too, uh, too much throughput requirements where it's not necessarily full on storage, but the demand is sufficiently high on query requ on requests and you've provisioned a very high number of uh, RUs, request units, you know, you've provisioned for a lot of throughput. So they'll, they'll split the container for you and keep that throughput high.
and that means a new physical partition, and then a move of roughly half of the logical partitions. Of, and it'll just happen to one physical partition. The other physical partitions will remain unaffected. And it will happen transparently and instantaneously and without impacting the service level agreement. And at that point, life goes merrily on. You want to avoid hot partitions. This obviously just doesn't look like a good picture. I don't have to explain why. It's just not uniform, right? Hot partition. We call that a hot partition on storage. We see red on top of that, right? Great. Um, this looks much nicer, but at least from a storage perspective, but what about throughput? Well, that's why creation data is often a poor choice because that means you're always going to be writing now to the same logical partition. And when you provision throughput on a container, it gets distributed between the partitions. So just to make the math easy, assuming in this case, since there are three physical partitions, if I had provisioned 30,000 RUs on the entire container, Cosmos DB would allocate 10,000 RUs to each of these physical containers, but clearly, at least on writes, and probably on reads too, because you're reading more recent data, uh, but certainly on writes, you're only getting 10,000 out of the 30,000 that you provisioned and are paying for. That is another hot partition on throughput this time. And that's why I said at the outset, username is always a great choice for this scenario, for a kind of like social network scenario. It's always going to be a good choice because all the users will be evenly distributed and you'll have a nice uniformity and it'll also, uh, both in terms of storage and throughput. I'm going to talk about cross partition queries uh, as though you should probably kind of get the idea of what they mean by now. It means crossing a logical partition. And if you cross a logical partition, you know, it could easily mean crossing a physical partition. So any kind of query where the username is known, like Mark in this case, and the partition key is part of your query, that's a single partition query. That's the desired case. That's the desired case. That's your your most common queries should be single partition queries, where you could then further filter within Mark and it would still be a single partition query. You, know, you can get not get all of Mark's documents, but uh, only those of a certain type, only those in a certain date range, et cetera. It would all be a single partition query because you know the username Mark. And so if you know the logical partition, you know the physical partition, and that's Cosmos DB, I mean, knows the physical partition, it knows where to go, and it's very direct and very efficient. But if you do just a simple query, but the partition query is not known, now this is spread across all of the logical partitions, which means a visit to all of the physical partitions which obviously is less efficient, which is not necessarily to say is evil. It's just, you don't want it to be your most common use case. Here and there, these cross partition queries are harmless because the cost for hitting a physical partition to look for something that isn't there is a single RU, which isn't, you know, no one's gonna count a single request unit here and there, no one's gonna notice. But if it's your like uh, pounding, you're pounding the system with these queries, bah, boom. It's just immediately evil. So, you know, you'll never be able to eliminate cross partition queries entirely. So you shouldn't strive to, you should just strive to keep them in, in, in the least common use case. And if you can't, then, you know, make a microservice to replicate a container. So you have two versions of the same data partitioned differently if you need to. Wow. Now we can come back to where we were, right? That was some pivot. So what's the right partition key? You need to know what your queries are. What's your typical queries to get a customer? The scenario here, and I just want to do a, uh, a quick time check. Okay, it looks like I'm about eight minutes behind. So I'm gonna to try to figure out how to, how, to, how to make up some of this time. So uh, we get a customer. Um, the scenario here is that you have a customer facing website. They log in and the customer you know needs to get the uh, information from their for their profile page where they can see their name their addresses their password and maybe change all of that information hmm. so it would be a query like this right you know you know you know the id and the id would be the customer id so now i'm going to say uh just to make it clear that in cosmos db every document is unique within a container based on a composite of the ID property, which I told you every document has to have, and whichever property you choose as the partition key, which could be any other property, which would be any other property, and often is. Like, uh, So well, what I'm saying is you could have two documents with the same ID if their partition key values were different. But then you could also go ahead and partition on the ID property itself. 
which is what I'm doing here. And it'll totally satisfy my most common queries. It sounds strange because now each document is in its own logical partition and there'll only ever be one document in a logical partition, but it's actually not bad. And this is actually gonna work for us for now. So that's what we're gonna go with. Time for our first uh, demo, very quick one. Just jumping on over to um, my notebook here. I'm not gonna explain some of the setup because uh, it's not really important. Uh, I'm gonna show you that we're moving on to version two. I mentioned that we were doing four versions. The first one is the worst one, nine containers. I told you, you don't wanna do this, but I'll just show you what it looks like. If you did, you would open up the customer container and you would see items there where each one of these items is a row from the customer table. Come on, come on Cosmos. Oh, why is it not behaving? Let's try the customer address container because that one's the more interesting one anyway. Oh, I don't know why it's not behaving now. Let's give it a one, ref let's give it a ref refresh and see if that helps. There we go. All right, so, whoa. Didn't mean to go that big there. Yeah, this is a row, like a row from, the, for, these are Cosmos DB appended system properties beginning with an underscore, ignore them for now. Although notice there's a timestamp, it's uh, always there, last updated. Um, but here, this is just a row. Remember I turned the IDs into GUIDs, but this is just a row from the customer address table. So there's your quote unquote foreign key. You don't know who the customer is because you would have to, you know, it's just you have to link to the customer by that ID in the other table. So this is bad with nine tables in web store v1. Moving on to web store v2, we have far fewer tables because we're doing embedding. Let me open up that notebook that was open before. Close that guy down over there. Let's go full screen and run setup and switch to web store v2. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to retrieve a customer because I know its ID and I'm gonna do it. I could do it two ways. I could do a query where I know its ID or I could do a point read. Let's do a point read. What does a point read mean? A point read means you know the document's ID and partition key. And if you are partitioning on ID itself as we're doing here, that's the same value. So there's only one thing you need to know to get a, a, a document, just its ID. You, which is this partition key, and there it is. It's Amanda Cook with the nested addresses. So it's still a single with a single query. I got a customer with their addresses and their password in a cost with a cost of one RU. And I'll just let you know in case you're not sure already, because you don't know already. Rather, that is the cheapest possible operation. There is nothing smaller than one RU. And if I do the same thing with a query, where the query could potentially return multiple documents, and therefore you know, querying on the ID with a known value, we would only expect one document. So we pull it out of the array, but it's otherwise functionally equivalent. I get back the same Amanda Cook with the same nested addresses and the same password, but a cost of almost three times as much. And that's uh, because, uh, well, the point there, no pun intended, is always choose a point read over a query when the doc, when, you, when it's one document and you know it's ID and partition key, those two things, and then what follows from there is if you've partitioned on the ID, then it's just the one thing that you need to know, which satisfies both the ID and the partition key. So uh, I'll pause now, see if there's any questions. No, we don't have any, thank you. Great, so let's move on to product categories. I'm gonna try to breeze through this because it's pretty straightforward. This is super simple. It's just a key value pair, right? It's just a key value pair. That's it. And, and we're going to store it by itself in this product category container. Uh, how are we going to partition it? Well, again, you, answer, you, you figure that out by answering the common question. The customer facing website, again, you're going to want to display all the product categories. And then the user will want to drill down into a product category for products in that category. So it's a pretty simple select star. Like, I want them all. I want everything in the lookup list. It's a reasonably sized lookup list. Well, in that case, you know, you, know, you want all of them in the same logical partition because you want to get the whole list at once and it'll never be anywhere near 20 gig for this list. And in that sense, what we do is uh, we do a little hack. We add a type of property, which anyway, I would advise you to have. The only schema requirement is that there's a property called ID. Beyond that, you're free to type your, to have and handle your own schema, but I think you should always have a type property to unambiguously indicate the type of document. 
And um, in this case, every document is going to have the same value in that type property called category. And so if I partition on the type property, um, I'll just have to add this to the where clause, which, you know, is going to get in all of them, right? Instead of a select star without a where clause, it's pretty much like as if I didn't have a where clause. Getting all of the items in that logical partition, which I'm defining as category by type. Let's see what that looks like. Um, yeah, so I did what I didn't show you here in WebStore V2. So we go to the customer container, which we were looking at before, and it's got to go to scale and settings, that it is indeed partitioned on the ID. And if I go to the products category container and go to its scale and settings, it's partitioned on type. And then if I look at the items, you know, these are all these items have the same type, right? So they're all in the same logical partition. These are just my categories. Oh, wow. The portal is really misbehaving today. Um, I think what I might do is open up a separate query window for the data explorer so I don't have to keep disturbing my notebook. But anyway, here, you can see them here by me running this query. I don't know why the data explorer is misbehaving. I'm not going to spend time to find out why. But these are what the documents uh, uh, look like. Here. Now it's going to give me a scrolling problem. But essentially, see, it keeps popping up on me. This is a new thing that just started this morning. We'll keep that open to the Data Explorer. Product category, which is partitioned on type, and they're all the same there. <laughs> See? Uh, all these system properties that we don't really care about. I'll go back to my notebook. I feel like I have to apologize for on behalf of Microsoft for these portal issues. But again, moving back on down to product categories, this is all of uh, this is um, all of them. Hold on, I have to set the database and container. Try that again. All right, so this is all of them, but we only really need, you know, everyone's type is category, right? And we only need the ID and the name, and we don't need all those other system properties. So I'll just want to go clear the output and say, um, instead of select star, and it just pull down all the columns, just pull down the ID and the name. Right, there's my list. There's my list of categories. And there's 37 of them, I think. Yeah. Four are used to pull them all out from a single logical partition, not in a pretty cheap operation. All right. Moving on. Product tags, they're identical. I'm just going to, they're just a key value pair. You do, we do exactly the same thing. So I'm not going to repeat that because I need to catch up on time, except the type would be tag. It's a lookup list. Product is where it gets more interesting because we have the many to many, remember? And with that many to many, how are we going to implement that? The answer is with a combination of embedding and referencing. On one side or the other of the many to many, you'll embed an array of IDs to the other side. And it really doesn't matter which side you do it to uh, on. In this case, I'm embedding an array of tag IDs in the product document pointing to the product tags. How would I then want to partition that container in that product container storing these product documents? Answer the same questions. It's always the same question. What are my most common queries? The, the user just selected a category on the website. They want all the products in that category. So we'll go ahead and do a um, select, you know, this is a typical query that will happen after the user you know, views and selects a category. Uh, they'll, the category ID will then be supplied to the next query to get all the products in that category. And that looks kind of nice. It means that, you know, all the products in the same category, same category will be in the same logical partition. If I want to get all the products in one category, it'll all come from one logical partition. But this will scale nicely as I add categories. Uh, I can keep adding categories and keep adding products to categories, and that works nice. And it satisfies my most common query. So I'll partition on that category ID. 
But now we have an issue where if I get the documents back, all the products in that category, can I display the information on the web page at this point? No, because I don't, I only have IDs for the category name and the tag names. I don't have the names themselves, the strings. So that means get ready for this. You need to run this query once to get all the products in that category. Then you need to run a second query to get the category name for that category. And then it doesn't get pretty here for each result returned by the first query. You need to run this third query to get the names of the tags for each document with that in query at the bottom. And this is at the point where if this wasn't virtual and, and you know, I, I would be hearing a lot of moaning and groaning right now, right? Because this is like, that's what relational databases are all about. It's like, you wouldn't think this would not be an issue in a relational world, you just do the joins. But since there are no joins, you have to run all these queries. And uh, that's when you pound your fist on, on, the, on the desk and say, where are my joins? So since there are no joins, we're just, we're gonna use, do a bit of denormalization. We're in the relational world. We're in the relational world. We strive to know. I'll be looking at a purple box now. Great. Um, in the relational world, we strive to normalize and avoid duplication and rely on joins and aggregations that are built in. That, you know, capabilities built into the relational database to you know join these things and aggregate these things on demand. In this world, we denormalize. We, we, we optimize for uh, reducing the number of query requests. Not, we don't, and without caring about duplication. And we don't think twice about duplication. And it's part of the way we do things in this world. So in addition to the category ID, and in addition to the tag IDs, I'm gonna also store the, a copy of, so this is not the master data of the, the, the category names and the tag names. This is just a copy that's present in the product document. So I don't have to, run those other queries since I can't join. That means, you know, we, you know, it means denormalization, duplication. We don't like to do it. It means at the point of insert, we'll, we'll duplicate that information. We'll know the category name and we'll know the tag names for all those IDs at, at the point of insert. But the question will then become, you know, a, a product name could change. Uh, I'm sorry, a product category name could change and a product tag name could change. And what we need to do is like cascade that change to the product container. And that's where the change feed comes in, which is a very powerful mechanism in Cosmos DB that I have an entire plural side course on, and we can do a whole other session on. But it is essentially a uh, something a, a kind of an event base, but it's also persisted, so you can always rewind and replay the events of what has happened in a container. And by keeping an eye on that, and the easiest way to do that is, is with an Azure function trigger, which is what I'll show you today. Uh, you can respond to an event. You can respond to a change uh, in any way that you need to. So there's a change feed on the product category container on the product tag container with that master data in it. Our Azure function could wake up when there's a change and cascade those changes to the product. And I'm, I don't have time to show you the code on code uh, uh, on Vis in Visual Studio, but here you have it in, um, here you have it on the slide, which is, this is all the code. So up top, you have a function name attribute, which makes this an Azure function. Where you're going to, this is for product categories and tags work similarly. They're a little more sophisticated because of the many to many, but we're not going to dig into that. It's just the concept that is what matters here that we need to cascade these updates. You are hand, <coughs> excuse me. This is all a uh, declarative information for a Cosmos DB attribute that wakes up when that collection, which is the old name for container product category in the web store database wakes up and there's a connection string and a pointer to a, a, a behind the scenes container that is called the lease container, which just maintains state behind the scenes, which is not important. As far as the actual parameters that are handed to you, which is the only thing that is important, you only need these two, the documents that have changed and a log uh, and something to log your output to and do some out logging and then iterate the changed documents, deserialize them into, it could be a strongly typed uh, POCO if you have one or a dynamic type, if you don't, here, in this case, I'm getting the new category ID and the new category name, and for each one, I'm calling this update. So there's no DML. Um, there's maybe more efficient ways to do a bulk update than this, but there's no actual DML statement to update multiple documents. So I need to select all the products in that category, right? But that's going to be very efficient because it's a um, single partition query. 
And so um, I just supply the partition key in the request options. And that's what makes it very efficient to get all the products in that category that need to be updated when I just iterate and that line of code there in memory will change the category name of the product and update the copy, if you will, for each product. Let's see that in action using the change for denormalization. It looks like I completely just now caught up on my eight minutes. So I apologize if I was talking a bit fast there. I will pause for questions before jumping uh, into the demo. There's no questions, thank you. Okay, great. So using the change for, you to, for denormalization, let's see that in action, kind of that code that I kind of raced through there. So now I'm in version three of our data model. And in version three of our data model, the only difference from version two is that we are denormalizing our data model. So there's that extra lease container that I mentioned, which you can ignore. It's not part of our data model. It's there for the change feed processor library behind the scenes underneath the Azure function to maintain state. And that's another discussion. As far as our data model is concerned, it's the same containers as version two, except however, if you open up any given product, um, I, uh, pro let's see, hopefully the, 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 the portal is behaving. Yeah, it's just not this morning. If you open up any given product, oh, there we go. Oh no, that's the other window. Maybe, uh, maybe we're still good in this one. Yeah. See the category ID? And there's a copy of the category name. See the tag array? It's not just an array of IDs. Well, they're not very imaginative names, but those are names that are copies of the, of the names that, and they would need to be updated similarly by an Azure function. So um, coming on back to our notebook, this is a known ID for the clothing shorts category. So I'm just gonna get the top five. And you can see each one has got a copy of the idea, a copy of the category name in addition to the ID. Clothing shorts, repeat it again and again, five times since I did a top five, but it could obviously be, it would, it would obviously be many, 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 many duplicates of that data. But now what's happening is, and uh, I'm gonna flip on it back on over to this Azure function here that I've running here. And I'm going to stop it and restart it because it has a tendency to go cold. Um, cause it's in, it's con consumption based and I'm going to go look at my functions and you can see I've got three functions, but for, for this version of the database, there's two of them, sync product category name and sync product tag name. And this one in the middle is for the next version. So ignore it. And we're just going to look at sync product category name. Cause that's we're we're about to change clothing shorts to something else. And we want to see the Azure function kick in and denormalize the data model. So I'm going to go hit monitor. and head over to logs, let it connect. And okay, it's connected. And what I'm going to do here in this next snippet of my, of my notebook, some more space there, is retrieve that piece of master data. So I know the ID of the shorts category, of, of the clothing shorts category. And remember, you need to do a point read. You need two things. You need the ID and the partition key. And remember for a lookup list, the partition key is type and every document, every category documents type is category. So you really still just need the ID, even though you need to supply the this kind of constant partition key value. Now I have it in memory. And this line of code here is changing the name from clothing shorts to clothing fun shorts and then replacing it in the container. And if I run this cell and it has now updated the document, we go head on back over to the Azure function. Well, there's some output coming out in blue. Change detected in one product category document. Oh, updating product, there we go, our code ran. The, the code that I showed you on the slide 
ran, updating everything to fun shorts. So going back to the notebook, same queries before, but after the update and after the um, and after the Azure function is run, look, but clothing fun shorts. Oh, there's the scroll problem again. Every time I click, uh, I'll just I'll hover the mouse. Clothing fun shorts. Next one, clothing fun shorts. See, it's been updated once, twice. Clothing fun shorts, three times, etc. And that is how you denormalize, or at least one way. Okay, I have to obviously refresh or it doesn't scroll properly. So I'm going to go on back into my notebook. So I apologize for that. Any questions on what we just saw? No, thank you. All right. So we have clear all our outputs. So we've gone through through to here. We're up to querying for sales orders. So that's our next next little chunk here. All right. So hopefully by now you know the drill. Step one is translate column names to property names, converting to camel case, making the primary key the ID property. That's step one. And then step two, ask embed or reference. Here, certainly we want to embed, right? Two megabytes can hold an order with all its details comfortably, even for our biggest orders, I would say. And there's an array there of order details. So again, solving the problem of Ref, no, ha, not having referential integrity and or constraints and not having joins, uh, those problems go away if you simply embed. Store that in a sales order container, right? Figure out the partition key, right? Ask yourself the question. So a customer is going to definitely, you know, again, going back to the custom fa customer facing website. So we're looking at a slide that says sales orders on top, right? Great. So moving back to a customer facing website, um, customers are going to want to look at all their orders, right? So uh, that's a typical query. But let's look at another not so typical query on the website end, but it's uh, on the back end. Like an executive might want a, a uh, their best customers by, uh, you know, the ones with the most orders uh, at the top, right? They want to see their top customers by order count. So let's start with the first one. The customer facing website, customer wants to see their orders. Um, the C here means container, not customer. So this would be this, the, or, the sales order container on the customer ID. So that would, of course, put each um, customer's orders in the same logical partition. And that would mean that we would want to partition on the customer ID, right? But now is what we'll, I'll say, whoa put your foot on the brakes and stop and think back that at the beginning of the session, we took the customer container and we partitioned it on the customer ID. Remember, it, it's, it was where we actually partitioned on the ID property itself in that customer container, the very first one. So in that container, there's one logical partition that has one customer in it to satisfy the most common query, select, you know, select start from customer where the customer ID is known. And that's the only thing you need to know. So that's the ID. So we partitioned on ID, but it's the same value. Yeah, it's called partition. It's called customer ID in the sales order container, and it's called ID in the customer container, but it's the same value that we're partitioning on. So what we're going to actually do is we're going to say, we don't need two containers. Why? Because we're schema free. It's okay to combine documents of different types in the same container. And that's a, you know very different than the way tables are, right? With defined schemas. There's nothing enforced. There's nothing to manage. There's schema, but it's you know basically each document's self self described schema. So that makes it possible, and not only possible but desirable, to combine different types of documents in the same container, particularly when they have similar access patterns and the same partitioning needs, like we have in this case. So let's go ahead and combine those into two container, into one container. So we won't actually go ahead and create a sales order container. We'll just stick with the customer container, but we'll store both customer documents and 
sales order documents in that container. Now we have a little fix up to do because the way things are now, it's not going to work. That customer container is partitioned on ID and in a sales order document, the ID property is the sales order ID. While in the customer document, the ID is the customer ID. So what we need to do is another little bit of denormalization in the sense of, you know, duplication, duplicating data. So taking that same ID value and making a, storing a copy of it in that customer document. So the ID property and the customer ID property have the same exact value. But now, because it's in a property called customer ID in both customer and sales order documents, we can now partition on the customer ID. And this is why back at the beginning, I said I, that I converted the integer IDs into the integer primary keys into GUID primary keys. But I could have done it by simply qualifying, you know, turning it into a string where the number, the, the ID, the primary key from AdventureWorks is preceded by a string that indicates the type. But, you know, obviously in the relational world, if you have two, a customer table and a sales order table, you can have two, you know, it's okay to have a, a customer ID of one and a sales order ID of one because they're in separate tables. But if they're in the same table, you know, you, they, they would collide, right? And so I went with the GUID. And the GUID is often, but not always, a good choice. Sometimes it's better to come up with something of your own. But anyway, they must have unique customer and sales order IDs, whether it's done by converting to GUIDs as I've done or by qualifying those numeric values in some other way to avoid collisions. Again, it's a best practice to add that type property. It's not necessary here. We're not partitioning on it, but we want to unambiguously distinguish our document types. We don't want to rely on guesses based on schema. That's very brittle assumptions that a lot of, I've seen, I've seen a lot of people do. It's very dangerous. Something like, okay, well, how do you know which one's a customer document and which one's a sales order document? Well, customer's got an email address, right? And the sales order doesn't. So if a document has an email address, then it's a customer. And if it doesn't, then it's a sales order. Yeah, that's fine until the day that you add an email address property to the sales order document, right? And then you're hosed. So go ahead and add that type property. And now you've got a logical partition with documents of different types, the customer and all of the sales orders in one logical partition. And you can get all the sales orders by querying on that type property to get just the three sales orders for the customer. Let's see how this works. Querying for sales orders. So I'll head on back over to the portal. And so you can see the Azure portal now, hopefully. All right, um, so I'm now gonna switch to Web Store v4. And, and the difference between version three and version four is that we're now combining types, right? So uh, it's just to refresh your memory, the first version was the worst version with nine containers. Then we reduced the number of tables in version two by embedding. And then in version three, we improved our data model without reducing the number of containers, but by duplicating properties and using the change feed to denormalize the data model to set so that our most common queries run very efficiently. And now in version four, we're actually combining types. So in one in the customer container, I have both customers and sales orders. So I know if I know the customer ID and I want to get their sales orders, this is the query to do it. Okay, thankfully it's not, this scroll is not jumping, but here are the two sales orders. Here's one, here's the first one with the embedded details. And the second one with the embedded details, this one's got multiple details. Two documents, pretty inexpensively. You know, it, it's never gonna cost less than, the rock bottom price of, of any query is like 2.8 RUs or something like that. 2.87 maybe. Now, what's funny is that, you know, if you, <laughs> that's 2.97 RUs, Hold on. What's kind of funny and interesting is that if you want to get a customer with their sales orders, it's the same query, but without limiting on the type, without saying, I just want the sales orders, just on the customer ID. 
and um, you get back three documents, slightly lower cost. It's almost like the cost of computing that, uh, you know, the type, the cost of calculating on this type to give you fewer documents is higher at 2.9 seminar use than uh, you know not having that not having that in the where clause but even returning one more document because now i've got the customer and why is the customer first this is another bit of a hack i would say but ordering by type and the type is customer or sales order and c alphabetically precedes s for sales order so i'm going to get the customer first so there's the customer now watch what i'm getting okay in this one query I'm getting the customer, all of their addresses nested beneath addresses, right? Because I embedded and the password because I embedded and all their sales orders. And each sales order has the details embedded, multiple details in the case of the second sales order. And you're getting all that payload back. And it's like actually 2.9 or use slightly less to get three documents. It's, so this is highly efficient now. And then that other query running in the back office, like, um, sorry, I didn't mean to do that. That other query in the back office, who are my best customers? Well, um, if this was a relational database, so it would be, it would be a no brainer, right? I mean, you would just do, uh, you would just do a count query. Uh, a group by whatever, you know, it'd be very simple to uh, do the join and the group by or whatever you had to do, or, or actually not require a join. You would just do a group by uh, uh, on the order table to get a count and order descending on the count. And you wouldn't even think, think twice about it. You just in a blink of an eye, right? But we can't do that here. Uh, it's, you know, things aren't, things aren't getting joined. So again, like avoiding the problem, problem of not having joins by pre-joining, Avoiding the problem of not having these aggregations by pre-aggregating. So inside the customer, go ahead and add a new property called sales order count. And this is more denormalization because it's a duplication. I'm not actually duplicating data. I'm duplicating the state of data. Meaning that if there are two sales order documents, this has the number two in it. But when I add another one, I have to increase it to three. So, you know, actually it looks like I'm missing a quote there. I have to fix that. There should be a quotation mark there. But my point is that there would be a number there that would uh, have to be incremented when you reach a new sales order, but then I wouldn't need to have to do an aggregation query because the aggregation is pre-calculated. What does that mean? It means that if I've got a part logical partition with a customer and three sales orders, if I want to add a new sales order, what do I have to do as well? Update the customer, increment that value. And I think it'd be pretty important for that to be done transactionally. Uh, you know, the change feed, as we saw, it's an out of band process. There's some latency, very low latency, but there is some latency between, uh, between the time that you make a change in the master data to the time it's propagated to all the denormalized entities that are holding copies of that master data. But this we want to be like instantaneous with zero latency. And so change feed would not necessarily be the best choice. And so instead of stored procedure, and actually with the dot, this doesn't have to be in done in JavaScript anymore. This can now be done in C Sharp using the um, transactional batch features of the .NET SDK. Uh, but you know, store procedures have been around forever in Cosmos DB. So that's how we're going to do it. And it's just something that runs on the server. Um, instead of when I have a new sales order, instead of just inserting it directly to the container, I will call a stored procedure to insert it into the container. And that stored procedure is called create sales order. It takes a new sales order document. It initializes some links, but what it is actually does is it first reads the customer document. And then it increments the sales order count of that customer document in memory on the server, but still in memory, this line of code actually persists it. This actually updates the, the document to the container or collection as it's called uh, in this case. But what's interesting is that we are now inside of an implicit transaction. In Cosmos DB, every store procedure has an implicit transaction wrapped around it. So at this point, if um, there's a failure or an error or it just doesn't complete for any reason, this is gonna roll back. That, that increment that, that, that will not persist. Because now I need to create the sales order document and if there's a problem with that, I wouldn't want that to commit. 
But if it's successful, and I you know don't have to return anything, but I'm returning something like the the new sales order count, for example. The point is that if it completes successfully, they will both commit. And then I run a simple query like this, right? Order by sales order count descending and get my top query. So this will be, I think, my last demo. Let me flip back on over to the portal. And how are we doing? Can we see my portal now? Excellent. Thank you. Um, so yeah, in Web Store V4, uh, I think I have it working in this other one. Uh, Web Store V4. Well, first of all, you can see that I've actually got even fewer containers. And again, ignore the least container. I'm down to three containers because in V4, uh, I've also combined the product category and the product tag containers. You might, some of you might have thought, hey, why do I need separate containers for those things? They're just too small lookup lists and then both partitioned on type. And that's why for my Azure functions, Oh, this one in the middle here, that's for version four. This is basically the same thing, but it's one Azure function instead of two Azure functions, because in version three, I had two containers, one for the product categories, one for the product tags, and each container has its own change feed. So if master data changed in either of these two containers, I needed two Azure, fun one Azure function each to do that, this one and this one. But in version four of the data model, if I look at the product meta container, You'll see I've combined them. Yeah, I've got categories and tags, both, but they're two different lookup lists. That's the partition key. Here's a category, here's a tag. And it's a type property that's keeping them in separate logical partitions, but one physical container. So I don't need a product category container and a product tag container like I had in V3. And then I don't need two Azure functions. I just need one, right? So it gets simplified. But getting back to our sales order count, I'll run, a, I'll run this query and get an error because this is a cross partition query. And at least with the Python SDK, you are expected to indicate that you are aware that you are running a cross partition query. And if you don't indicate that, you will get this error. It's disabled because you haven't said, I know I'm running a cross partition query. And uh, why is it a cross partition query? Well, we're type equal customer, right? I'm, I'm selecting top 10 of, uh, and I want to get, you know, the sales order count and the name, some information about the customer, I'm, but I'm doing an order by that sales order count descending. Okay. Uh, but, you know, where type is customer, that's every customer in the container. That's definitely a cross partition query. It's not evil if some exec is sitting in some back office this has a dashboard open and they refresh it a few times a day or several execs refresh it a few times a day. It's, it's not going to harm anything. And don't try to over-engineer your data model to avoid every partition, every uh, cross-partition query in every single case because you're probably not going to be able to. And if you do, I would argue you've over-engineered things. This is perfectly fine. Just go ahead and say, I know that I'm running a cross-partition query. And if you do that, it will run. It will run. You know, it... it, it, it it's transparent. I mean, behind the scenes, uh, every partition has to be visited. And if there are results on multiple partitions, they have to be unioned. And that happens for you automatically. You don't have to do any of that work yourself. But it's clearly more overhead and therefore undesirable and, and, and actually bad if it's your very common query pattern that you're constantly hitting the server with. So who do I have as my top customer, top 10? Well, there's, it looks like Mason Roberts and Dalton Perez are in first place. It's 28 each. Then there's a few with 27 and then they're gonna go down, et cetera, and so on, okay? Well, what I want to do now is create a new sales order for, for is that Dalton? 44A, scroll back up just a bit. Yeah, 44A is Dalton. Oh, there it's jumping again. I'm gonna refresh. Very annoying. I'm all the way down here now. Okay. 
So I, I'll do it with cross partition queries enabled. Uh, I didn't switch to, have to switch to V4. Okay. Mason Roberts and Dalton Perez tied at 28. I want to create, and Dalton Perez is, ID is 44A6. So let's go ahead now and say, I, I want to create a new sales order for that customer ID. And this just generates a GUID for the new sales order ID. Well, like I said, I'm going to call a store procedure. I'm going to pass this new order document to a store procedure. I'm not going to write it directly to a container. And no, there's no, really no way to force the developer. You have to just, you know, have, uh, you know, everyone has to behave. Uh, you can just write the document to the container and you'll, and you'll mess it up. But if you don't write it to the container and said you call the store procedure, here is the new order with some details. It's not really important. The, uh, it's got, a, you know, that's the customer that this new order belongs to. That's Dalton. And I'm going to call the store procedure. That's the store procedure that we saw on the slide. I'm just going to show you that it's actually here in the database. I wouldn't be surprised if the, the portal is going to refuse to show it, but they're under store procedures is SP create sales order. Yeah, it's refusing to show it. Maybe I'll show it in this one. Oh, come on. Web store v Oh, sorry. It's the customer container. Oh, then now that's V3. Jeez. Customer and your V4 has a stored procedure. SP creates sales. Oh, there it is. There's the code that we saw on the slide. So let's run it. There, there it ran. Let's run the same top 10. The same top 10 query now shows Dalton Perez. Ah, it's jumping again, but there, I'll hover the mouse. Dalton Perez is 29. Went up by one from and taking the lead over uh, all the other customers as top customer. And there you have it. It is 9.11 at this time with four minutes to go. Look at our final design. We have one container with two document types in them. Each document type has embedding so that there's really only two types instead of what would be, in this case, five. A product container with all our products, a product tag container and a product category container. But remember, we combine those into the one product meta container, three containers down from nine and a well-organized model. The key takeaways, identify what your key access patterns is and design your data model against them. Partitioning is obviously critical. If you don't get it right, you're not going to get that scale and that performance that, you, that the horizontal partitioning uh, mechanism provides in Cosmos DB. How do you materialize relationships? Embed when it's one to few or one to, or when it's one to one or one to few, or when you're updating and selecting items frequently together. You can also do the same. You can also materialize relationships by denormalizing so that you don't have to uh, join and pre aggregating, as we saw. You can store multiple related entities in the same container, and that's in the sense they are uh, they are they are related simply because they're in the same logical partition, like that logical partition that's holding the customers with all their orders, right? I mean, if you think about it, we got all our joins back when we ran that cross partition. When we ran that, uh, I'm sorry, when we ran that query that returns a customer with all their documents, we didn't need to do a join, but we got we got the data that we needed very efficiently. And you can use the change feed to denormalize data or you can use store procedures to do so in a transaction. I wanna thank you. I'll, I see we've got two minutes, so I can certainly stop and pause. And I haven't gotten a single question this entire session. So uh, if you will have one, certainly throw one out at me. We still haven't received any. Wow, okay, well then I sure hope that you enjoyed the session. And, um, and that you enjoy the rest of PASS 2020.